For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another issue of the People's Health Dispatch. Uh, in today's episode, we are talking to two public health professionals from Beirut, Lebanon, with Aline uh, Germani and with uh, Samer Jabur, who uh, are both public health experts. And today we are going to talk a bit about what is happening in Lebanon, so the new changes that the that the country faces. Could you give us a brief overview of the situation for the past year? So as we all know, we have been uh, uh, going through actually the past uh, two years an economic crisis that has escalated and brought to its um, final, yani, I think, stages in, uh, in the past uh, maybe six to seven months. If we want to focus on the water crisis in particular, uh, you know that the uh, crisis that has been um, that we have been experiencing for the past four months, which is related to the fuel crisis. Uh, what we need to put in context before that is that Lebanon, uh, yani for decades even, has been suffering from water issues. It's a country that has plenty of water resources and sources, uh, but we already have a lack of uh, water supply from, uh, from water establishment, from governmental and public uh, water establishment. Uh, the same for electricity. So electricity generation by the government is very, very poor. Uh, we, have, uh, we have always had for the past like uh, 10 to 15 uh, years, uh, almost uh, no publicly generated electricity. We have almost six to seven hours max of electricity per day. So the country is run by on generators. Uh, and uh, this brings the two issues together. Sometimes we do rely on water tanks to distribute clean water. And this is water that we pay for privately, for those who can afford it, of course. And for potable water, almost every uh, household in Lebanon, again, for the past at least 10 years, count or buy either in bottles or in gallons that are distributed in homes. Uh, again, for those who can afford it. Now, with the fuel crisis that has hit Lebanon in the past four months, electricity is not being generated, of course, and uh, all generators cannot run and cannot operate. And this is why water establishment cannot uh, pump, nor treat, nor supply water. The same for the, these private distributors who pump water and, uh, and uh, distribute water to homes. It has escalated uh, almost to, the, to dire, uh, dire, let's say, a dire situation that is threatening livelihoods uh, for the past one month now. It probably is the, um, the, is the country, as Aline said, is, is the country that has the most uh, 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 water resources in, uh, among the countries that have the most water resources in the region um, and the least amount of water insecurity. Now, this is uh, also a country, however, that's, um, that's at war with itself and with, uh, um, with its identity. It's gone through a, live, a civil war, a 15 year civil war from 1975 to 1990. Um, um, and it has had a dysfunctional post-civil war governance uh, characterized by sectarian governance. The centers of power are distributed between the, uh, the heads of different sects and therefore has pr produced uh, compromises uh, that have unfortunately come um, at the expense of, uh, of the public interest. Now, uh, whether previously or now, the resulting policies have remained the same, is that, uh, is that uh, um, there's no fiscal responsibility, um, um, uh, there's no uh, commitment to investment in public services. When there's no commitment uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to the public goods, to the common public goods, and when there are vested interest in private profit of the water, of the electricity, of all of that, you find that we moved month to month almost on purchasing uh, fuel to generate uh, electricity as opposed to investing in infrastructure, um, um, uh, hydropower or other means to generate uh, electricity on a sustainable basis. Um, the same goes for all the other sectors. In 2015, um, we, you, were, uh, you will recall that we had a major crisis, which was the, uh, the garbage crisis. 
And unfortunately, this did not lead to any significant political change. However, in uh, the further deterioration of the situation, as well as the other political um, uh, developments led to the uprising in uh, October of 2019 that led to the resignation of uh, Prime Minister then Saad al-Hariri, which took a long time to get a replacement, a compromise government that was also not seen to be highly effective by Hassan Dia, which also also resigned then sh- soon afterwards and the and the aftermath of the Beirut expl- explosion the explosion um, exacerbated the uh, uh, all of the other crises that uh, that had preceded uh, and we are right now a year down the line uh, with an, uh, with a government that was formed a few days ago and um, uh, we are hopeful that there will be some change uh, forthcoming uh, but we are not uh, ignoring the fact that the crises of Lebanon are so deep um, entangled with regional crises that they could actually not be solvable merely with the formation of a compromised government. Uh, thank you for such a good introduction and also for mentioning the explosion. Uh, and of course, you both being health experts and uh, present in the field, uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about how in this context, the COVID-19 pandemic hit and how did Lebanon and its health system cope with what has happened uh, over the past year or so? We have been living for quite a few decades now in a weak state uh, that has little uh, public service. From the beginning, there is a lack of uh, social protection in Lebanon. Uh, we are in a hybrid health healthcare system where funding is Uh, private and uh, public, and the public funding is pretty much uh, fragmented, uh, which leads to a situation of lack of, uh, of, lack of social protection. Um, uh, not lack of health care, but lack of social protection. The pandemic, of course, uh, did not affect us as much as the economic crisis. And this is what affected mostly uh, the health, uh, uh, not the health system, but the health and the protection of the residents and the population. When the economic uh, crisis hit and when the banks uh, took uh, the money of the people hostage, because this is what happened, I consider it the biggest uh, money heist of the century. This led to a real threat to to, uh, people being able to afford healthcare. Uh, The elderly in Lebanon who are above 64, who are in retirement age, who spared and uh, uh, money and saved money f- all their life to be able to afford at least health care and uh, pay for food and survival and whatever, uh, cannot touch this money anymore. The Beirut explosion has exacerbated, of course, uh, to a peak, to a high peak, Uh, the cases of corona in uh, in Lebanon, accompanied by the economic crisis, there is an incapacity of people, of the government, to rebuild, uh, to rebuild hospitals that were totally destroyed. Add to this, uh, of course, the issue of the currency, uh, as we said, a money heist, which is, uh, it's not only the people who suffered from this, but also big institutions like hospitals or primary health care centers or non-governmental organizations, and thus the uh, shortage in medication. Add to that the highest migration of health care professionals ever, ever, in Lebanon, ever. And here we're not talking about fresh graduates, which used to be the case after the Civil War. Today in Lebanon, physicians who are very well established in hospitals, in their private clinics, in the public sectors, uh, public sector also, senior physicians have left the country in numbers. So just like any country, we've gone through waves of uh, of infections and we've tried multiple approaches to containment or, uh, and so. The fact that Lebanon houses um, the second highest, perhaps, um, uh, uh, percentage of, uh, of um, uh, displaced people to the population in the world. One out of six, perhaps, people who live in Lebanon is a displaced person. So the country um, uh, really provides a, a global good by uh, 
supporting refugees, mostly uh, Syrian refugees, as well as older Palestine refugees that has pr uh, produced about a million refugees in Lebanon. So this is a country that has about four and a half, five million. So you could imagine what a million refugee um, uh, mean. Those are refugees just like other parts of the population have been affected by the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. They've been among the most impoverished by the COVID uh, pandemic. The COVID response in this country or so is that it has been affected by the same constraints on, uh, on, on public performance as other sectors as well. Uh, one of the problems that everyone is aware of is, uh, is that uh, uh, the decisions that were uh, made uh, last December, for example, to open up the, uh, the country to expatriates so that there's a, an influx of uh, fresh, uh, fresh cash and uh, with the fresh visitors to the country led to a major, major outbreak uh, uh, that uh, took weeks to control uh, with uh, with a lot of lost lives uh, um, from uh, from January to to uh, to March and April of, of this year, um, so uh, these um, uh, these issues uh, uh, again, as Ali said, converge with the other crisis to produce the situation where we are today. There is one one more point that we wanted to go through today, uh, and that is related to something that you mentioned before, Summer, and it's related to the new government. So if I'm, if I'm not wrong, it was on Friday that it was announced that there was a new government form. So uh, I would be interested to hear a bit more if you have any expectations about that. Weird enough in Lebanon, government or no government, we have uh, learned through the years that uh, it's the same. So for the past 13 months, as you said, we have been without the government and it doesn't affect much uh, any of the... Um, uh, any of our uh, operations. We are a country and the people that uh, are able to govern themselves without, uh, without a government. Uh, so uh, to say the least that it's a government that, is be that was brought by the same parties that were ruling the country for the past many years um, and with the same uh, conditions. Uh, of the previous uh, of the of the previous several uh, governments that have been created and uh, and resigned in the past uh, two already in the past two years and and before that uh, so we cannot expect much because these are the same parties that have for the past 30 years uh, and even more uh, structurally and systemically leading us to a point of uh, crisis they could have, during the past two years, even if there was no uh, government in the past 13 months, and since the revolution in uh, October 2019, they could have started uh, thinking about a strategy to salvage the country if they wanted to. Uh, I think they have the brain to do so, but they have no will to do so. And this is why uh, I'm not sure Samer had some hope. I have no hope at all. This government uh, was born out of uh, a, a regional compromise. Uh, re, um, you know, um, so uh, so the, the reason that we have not had a government over this past year is, by, is because the conditions for a political regional compromise were not there. Regional slash international. I mean, we're talking here about a, a, an agreement between the Biden administration with Hezbollah, uh, Syria and, and others uh, to pass uh, essentially um, uh, gas uh, through, um, uh, through Syria to, uh, to, uh, to Lebanon. Uh, it's quite clear that that th this government and the, the conditions for its uh, birth um, explain uh, why Lebanon will will be in um, um, uh, in a difficult uh, uh, situation for years to come um, because it's always at, uh, at the uh, at the table of compromise between regional and international powers now um, I'm hope still hopeful that this current government will produce a bit of uh, relief to the uh, to the uh, to the people the electricity and the uh, um, and the gas and the water situation is unbearable right now and i and uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that there will be some uh, some uh, some reforms uh, made and uh, that aid will start flowing uh, but i share um, 
um, uh, uh, Lin's assessment that uh, uh, that radical reform, um, um, uh, to, to say the least, justice for the for the for the uh, victims and the families affected by the Beirut explosion, for example, um, I'm with Aline that uh, we are not uh, yet seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you both for sharing your thoughts with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.